Okay, we're starting here on uh, in chapter 11 of module seven for the uh, stockholders equity. And I'm beginning with number two. With number two, these are not difficult. If you've watched the lecture uh, and did, uh, did our practice, these aren't difficult extras um, on number two here. The only thing that's gonna be difficult when you're doing these in the homework or in any of the practice is paying a close attention to the wording if it's par value, if it's no par, or if it um, is, in this case, this one here, no par, this one is 50 preferred. It's just making sure it's called the right name. So this one, okay, let's look at number one, record the issue of 4,000 shares at $5 par for $35,000 cash. Okay, so they go and just tell you how much you brought in, 35,000. We're bringing in common stock, but look at all the different common stocks there are. We want to pick the one that says $5 par value. 4,000 times $5 each. If you do the math, that's 20 grand. And then they call it, instead of, I, I use the term additional paid in capital. The book just used paid, paid in capital. Make sure you pick the right one. So paid in capital of par value, don't use the stated value. That's the only difference here. That's because this one's dealing with par. For number two, they're telling us here that they have 2,000 shares of no par stock in, in, promoter, in exchange to their promoters. What this means is basically as a thank you for helping us set up the business. And what, they, what you call that, instead of getting cash, because the, they're, they're not paying us cash, they're basically giving us their labor. We call that an organization expense. So we had an, a value of all of their donated time of, it's not donated, we're giving them stock. Organizational expense of 40 grand. And then the stock has a $1 per share stated value. So I'm gonna do common stock, $1 stated value. And that's going to be $1 times the number of shares, so 2,000 shares. The rest would be the paid in capital in excess of the stated. So this time we do want to use this one. And that would be the 38 grand. So that's what you just got to look for on these. This one again would be, uh, this one has, oh, let me show you this one. This one has no stated value and it's also no par. We have the same debit, the organizational expense, 40 grand. But if it has no stated, no par value, the common stock is simply all of it. Common stock, no par. Let me try to pick the right one. No par. Common stock, no par is just the full 40. There is nothing to go to additional paid in capital. So we can start to work here, and I know I didn't do the last one, but this one, the only thing different is, is it's preferred stock. So you just gotta pick the one that's preferred. Okay, so that's, just make sure you look at the, the wording closely, and then if it has no par value, no stated value, then all of it goes to common, nothing but additional paying capital. Okay, the next one I wanted to look at is number four. Okay, with number four, we're gonna to have to kind of get these numbers either memorized or we need to jot them down somewhere. There's, there's different stuff that's going on that we're gonna to need to, to do the, uh, the requirements down below. All right, so our stock is, is currently at $62 a piece per share before any stock dividend or split. It tells us here that we have $10 par value stock Right now, we have 50,000 shares that are outstanding. So that's how they get to 500,000, 50 times 10. The rest of it that the people paid over and beyond the 10 bucks, the 200,000, and then we got our retained earnings. All right, assume the company declares and distributes a 50% stock dividend. That's huge. Remember, I said in the lecture, if it's over 25%, you, you base the value of the dividend on the par. And if it's under 
then you base it on the value of the stock at 62. But this one's over 25, so we're doing it on the par value. And it tells us here, like I had said in the lecture, that we're just going to put it right into retained earnings. We're not even going to worry about the dividend account. So let's, uh, let's look at this. It says we're going to complete this little chart on what happens to the value of our common stock. What, what may help here is to do a little journal entry and maybe even have our T accounts up. Otherwise, you, you need to do this off on the on a side sheet of paper. I'm just going to do it here so you can see it. So if we issue a new uh, dividend here, we're going to debit our retained earnings because we're issuing a dividend, but we need to figure out how much we're, we're going to uh, put in. And then we're going to credit our common stock and then potentially any additional paid capital that goes into it which in this case we won't have because we're going to issue it at par. Uh, all right, so our retained earnings. We're issuing a 50% stock dividend. So right now we have 50,000 shares. 50% of that says we're going to add another 25,000 shares. So 25,000 at $10 par that's how much I'm going to be putting into my retained earnings. 25,000 shares at $10 par, that's $250,000. And that's, that is the par value, because that's what you have to do it at when it's over 25%. So we don't even need this. So let's go down and answer some of these questions based on what we just did. All right, before the stock dividend, these, this first column here is just gonna be real easy. It's just bringing the numbers straight down. We had common stock value at 500,000. And let's go ahead and put them all in, these first numbers. We had 200,000, it said, for the additional paid in capital. And then retained earnings, 660. And number of common shares outstanding was 50,000. All right, common stock. What happened? Impact of the stock dividend? Well, basically the journal entry says we added another 250,000 um, because of the dividend. And so my total is $750,000. I didn't put anything on this one into the excess of par, so it's still at 200,000. Retained earnings, I go back to my journal entry, I debited my retained earnings, so that's subtracting 250,000. So the impact of the dividend was a negative 250,000. And what that leaves me then is a balance you take 250,000 less the 660, you get 410 left. And look how that worked out. My, my total stockholders equity, 1.36. After the stock dividend, it's still 1.36. I just took money out of one account and put it into somewhere else. That's basically all that happened in, within the same category. We had an extra 25,000 shares, so a total of 75 shares of stock. Now before we do step two, let's go ahead and check. Okay, good. Everything looks good. Now step two says instead of doing the stock split, we're now doing a three for two stock split. So for every two shares you have, you now have three. So another way to think about it at is a one and a half for every one. So you're gaining a half a share, an extra half a share. All right, uh, instead of the dividend, answer these questions. All right, so let's go to requirement number two. All of our numbers are still the same. We had 500,000. We had 200,000 in my additional paid in capital and 660 in retained earnings. Total shares, uh, 50,000. 
Now, whenever there's a stock split, remember there's no journal entry. So nothing happened here. My common stock is still at 500,000. Because I didn't do a journal entry, my paid in capital is still 200. Um, this is still zero. This, zero. Oops. Paying earnings, nothing. Still 660, nothing. Total number of shares outstanding, that did change. And that went to 25,000 more shares. Because remember, it was one and a half uh, split. So they got an extra half a share, so half of the total. So this is the only number that stayed the same. Nothing else would have changed. That's what a stock split does. It doesn't do anything to your books. There's no journal entry. All it does is increases the number of shares and decreases their par value. Basically what they're worth, in a sense, even in the market. All right, the next one I have listed is uh, number six and seven, actually five, six, and seven. So that's this, these, the, these three are kind of go together. All right, so these numbers we're gonna kind of memorize again. We got, uh, let's get these in our head. $10 par again, we've got 60,000 outstanding paid in capital and retained earnings. All right, so on the fifth, we're going to give out a 20% stock dividend. And this is, so this is different now. This is stock dividend, and it's only 20%. So uh, we're going to use the value of the actual market price, not the par value in this case, because it's less than 25%. We're going to give it to the people who are record holders as of the 15th, and then we're actually going to pay it on the 28th. The stock, it, the stock market is valued, or the uh, shares is 40 bucks on the date. That's the one we're going to use. And the stock market value is 33.40 on. Okay. So let's do the uh, the entry. So the first one here is record the declaration of the 20% 20, 20 stock dividend. So we're doing 20% of this. That's how many shares are outstanding. We're giving out an extra 20%. 20% of that is 12,000, 12,000 shares. And we're gonna do it at the market price because it's less than 25%. The market price on the day, that's the one we, this is the one we wanna use, 40 bucks. So if I use 40 times uh, 12,000, the amount of my dividend, so 480,000. So we're going to debit our retained earnings for the 480,000. And we're not going to go, we're not going to debit uh, common stock yet. We're going to debit something very similar that says common stocks almost. Common stock dividend dis, uh, distributable because we aren't giving out the money yet. And notice I didn't call this a dividends payable because it's not actually cash. So we're giving out uh, the par value. So you, typically we would have just credited common stock, but we're going to do the same thing, but just not quite yet. We're not going to do the common stock. We're doing the distributable. 12,000 shares at $10 par. So 12,000 times 10 is 120. And we can go ahead and then do the regular paid in capital of excess of par for the difference. So this would be 360,000. And then all we've got to do is show that on the 28th, when we actually give out the stock, all we're going to do is debit this distributable. It's no longer distributable because I am I'm actually giving it out as common stock. And common stock, remember it had a $10 par value in our example up above. So that's what we're going to credit.
Okay, so that takes us now to number six. Number six is using the same information. The, what's different here is they actually look at it from a stockholder standpoint. It says the stockholder, uh, one stockholder owns 800 shares out of the 60,000 before the stock dividend. And we're gonna compute the book value of this of per share and then the total book value immediately before and after. All right, so the book value per share before. Book value per share is simply, remember uh, I had this in the very last piece of my notes from the lecture. All you gotta do is take total stockholders equity and divide that by the number of shares outstanding, so 60,000. So before, Book value per share is 26.25. And then this is total book value of his shares, of the guy who has 800. So simply just take the 26.25 times 800, 21,000. Now what we're gonna see then is after the stock dividend, his book value of shares should be in a sense, about the same. It'll be a little bit just due to rounding and just having numbers a little bit off, but it'll be real close to 21,000. Let's see. So the book value per share after the stock dividend. So after the stock dividend, remember total stockholders equity doesn't change because you're just moving some numbers around. We just moved them from here to here, you know, retained earnings up to common stock. What does change though is the number of shares issued. We've added now another 12,000 shares. So what we're gonna do is take our 1575, because that number doesn't change when we issue a stock dividend. But we're gonna divide that now by 72,000 shares because we added another 12,000. So the book value per share went down, 21,75. However, the number of shares that this guy owns, he got an extra 20% uh, more. So 20% of 800 is 160. So he now has 960 shares. So if I take this new sh uh, share price, which went down, but he made up for it by having more shares. Look at that, it came out to be exactly the same the work it should verify that now we're ready for the last piece um, what we have here compute the total market value of the investor shares in part two okay so the market value let's do that uh, it's at 40 bucks a share on February 5th before, and he has 800 of shares. So market value is 32,000. Now the market value, since there's more shares out there, the market value will drop, just supply and demand, basic economics. It's now at 3340, but he has 960 shares. He has more shares at a little bit lower price. And look how close it comes out to being the same, essentially the same, 36, 32064. And let me check our work, and that should show that we got that. Yep, 32064. All right, the next one I want to look at is number nine. Nine and 10 go together. I might have to put the chart there in a little bit. All right, this one, it deals with uh, who gets dividends and how much do they get? So it tells us here, we have outstanding stock, 80,000 shares of this preferred stock. And remember, this tells us how much dividends are gonna be paid and it's based on the par value. So our preferred stockholders aren't getting that much, seven and a half percent of $5, that's, that's pretty low. It's a pretty low number. And then we have 200,000 shares of common stock at a dollar par. And then these are the cash dividends that I give out every year. So we're gonna see who gets what, 
based on the amount of dividends and 10 and 11 go together because number 10 here says assume the only difference between 10 and 11 is that word right here. Number, uh, number, or actually, yeah, no, this is nine and 10. So the only difference between nine and 10 is number nine is the preferred stock is non-cumulative, which means they do not get past dividends that they might've missed out on. All right, so when we first start this one, the first line up here is basically gonna tell us how much do my preferred stockholders get? So we're gonna kind of do the calculation. All right, the par value of the preferred shares, that told us that, that was five bucks. The dividend rate, that was seven and a half percent. So we just do the calculation, dollars times 0 0.075, tells us to take it out to three decimals, 0 0.375. It tells us that, that there are 80,000 shares out there. Each share gets 37 and a half cents. So what that means is simply take the three, 37 and a half cents times the number of shares. This is what we owe to our preferred stockholders every year, as long as we give out dividends. They get the first 30,000. Everything else goes to common stock. All right, so they get the first 30. In 2015, only 20,000 was paid. So preferred gets all of it. Common, there's nothing left for common. That's why it's the most risky, the most rewarding. In this case, the most risky. Dividends and arrears, that's saying how much do they get uh, for any dividends they didn't get this year, preferred. They're missing out on the uh, 10 grand because they're supposed to get 30. But with this being non-cumulative, don't get to have anything in arrears. So all of these are just going to be zero. We'll find. Paid to preferred in 2016. Well, preferred get the first 30. 30 wasn't even given, so they get everything. Common gets nothing, but preferred also don't get the other 2,000 left over. Now, the the company really turns it around, gives out lots of dividends in 2017. This is where the common stock get the reward. Preferred stockholders only get the first 30, in this because it's non-cumulative, so that's all they get. Common get everything else. They get 170,000, so they're really re reaping in the rewards this year. Nothing left over for preferred. And then in 2018, preferred just get their 30,000. Common get to enjoy the rest, which is even better, $320,000. Nothing in arrears for preferred. So once you get going, this one isn't that hard. The only difference now with number 10, the exact same problem, everything's the same, except the only word that's gonna be different is this cumulative word here. Preferred stock is now cumulative. It's telling us that um, assume, uh, determine the amounts of dividends paid each year, the two class holders. I think it tells us somewhere that they are paid up to date or otherwise this is the first year. So the first line is gonna be exactly the same as we did in number nine. Par value is five bucks, seven and a half percent, 7.375 is what they get per share. The number of shares, Remember that was 80,000 and then they are to get 30 grand a year. And they are to get 30 grand a year. If they don't, then they get it in the next year. So preferred, just like we had before, they get the first 30. So if there's only 20, they get all of it. Nothing goes to common. The only difference here is dividends in arrears. They get another 10,000 going into the next year as long as so they are going to be guaranteed not only 30, but an extra 10 going to be 40,000. Well, they didn't give out 40. They didn't even give out the full 30. So preferred almost get everything they are guaranteed for 2016. Nothing goes to common. And not only do they have 10 from last year that they roll over into this year, they have another 2,000 that they add on because they didn't quite get 30 yet again. 
So now they get 12,000 going forward in addition to their normal third. So when we come down to 2017, there's plenty of dividends to go around. Preferred gets 30, but they also then, there's extra here, so they get all the extra 12 that they are due from years past. So they get the 30 plus the 12. They get 42,000. The rest then goes to common, which is still quite a bit. They still have 158 left for common. Now there's nothing in arrears because all of it was paid up. And then 2018 is going to be just like on number nine. Third or right back to 30. You get a big chunk in 2018. Nothing is in arrears because preferred got everything that they were supposed to. Okay, I just wanted to show you what this one is going to look like. This one um, doesn't take too long. This is if we found that there's an error, what do we do? And you, well, you're going to want to correct it in your statement of retained earnings. You'll make a journal entry, and then it gets corrected here in your statement of retained earnings. So um, what we're going to start off with is our balance of retained earnings prior to the discovery. So we want to pick the right one. There's a whole bunch of them here to pick from. This one looks like it's the right one because it's um, December 31, 2016, but this says the adjusted amount. We don't want that. We want the retained earnings before any adjustment. And that's at 1,375,000. Now the adjustment here, we need to make an adjustment for that, um, the depreciation expense that that was not put in so the depreciation expense we need to show that we need to pretend that that's that that should have been there so we need to go in and take away fifty five thousand five hundred that's bringing our retained earnings down because we had an extra expense that we forgot to include in in that year so now this would be our corrected or our adjusted 2016 retained earnings. Then we do the rest of the retained earnings statements just like what we had done way back in week one. We add in any net income for this year. We had net income of 126,000 and subtract out any dividends. Less dividends, we will put in cash dividends of 43,000. And that's all you gotta do for that one. It's just putting in the right titles and knowing how it's supposed to look. Oh, I just, oh, one thing I forgot here is this guy here. That would simply be our December 31, 2017 retained earnings. Okay, two more left. Uh, I wanna look at 12 and then at 18. 12 is uh, looking at the, just the formula on how to do the earnings per share. And we went over this uh, briefly in my lecture notes. So I wanted to show you here, this one doesn't take long. You should get, remember the, uh, the, the earnings per share is best case scenario. If we gave out all of our earnings, how much will stockholders get, our common stockholders? Because that's, that's the whole thing with dividends is you're, you're distributing the earnings to all of your owners. Just like if you were the owner of a company and you made money, you would be getting it. But then the company has to decide, uh, do I really wanna give out all of my earnings or do I wanna keep some back for a rainy day or to build my company? Because you can use your earnings to build up the company. So earnings per share basically says best case scenario. How much would my common stockholders get if everything was distributed? Even if that may be unlikely, it's a way to compare business to business because they all give out different amounts of dividends. But with earnings per share, uh, common stockholders are never gonna get first dibs. So they always have to take away whatever preferred are gonna get. So that's what this is, that's what this is doing here. All right, so it says best case scenario, if we were to give out everything, we could give out 
2.7 million net income. But if we're going to give out stuff, we got to take away what preferred stockholders get. And it says um, net income and declares 388,000 of cash dividends on its preferred stock. So they get 388,000 O2O. So best case scenario says this is what we have left to give to our common stockholders. So when we come down here to see what are my common stockholders going to get? Well, remember we do net income available to my common stockholders because that's net income minus the preferred divided by the weighted average of your number of shares outstanding. So let's just put in the numbers. We got the 2311980 available. Tells us up here that we have 678,000 shares of common stock. And then they, the program went ahead and did the math for us. Each share is going to get $3.41 best case scenario. Doesn't mean that's what they're going to get, but that's a way to compare companies. So that was uh, looking at earnings per share. All right, the last one I wanted to do is number 18. It kind of puts everything we've done together, and we're going to be looking at very similar to the problem that I did. Uh, we may not do them all, and we'll see. We'll see how far it gets. I don't know that I'll get down here and do number two and three because you can do these. You'll just need to keep T accounts. Uh, but we'll we'll do a few we'll do, we'll do some of these journal entries just to see how they're similar to what we just did in the lecture earlier. All right. So what you would want to do is you want to have T account started with these amounts, just like how we did in our practice. So we'd have seven hundred fifty thousand in common, and then our uh, APIC. Notice we don't have any preferred yet, and then retained earnings of three hundred forty thousand. All right, on January 2nd, we purchased 3,000 shares of our own stock. So we call that treasury for $25 a piece. Okay, so we're just going to simply debit our treasury stock and do the simple calculation 25 times 3,000. $75,000. To get that, we had to pay money. 75,000. That was pretty easy. Now what we are going to, I'm going to want to keep a little note off to the side is I have 3,000 shares and they cost me 25 bucks each. So when I uh, reissue those at some later point, I'm going to need to remember that. All right, next thing we got to do. Remember when we give out a dividend, we give out dividends on how many shares are outstanding. Well, we got to come back up here and see that A, we had at the beginning of the year 30,000 shares outstanding, but we just bought back 3,000 more. So we only have 27,000 shares outstanding at the time. And we are giving a cash dividend of $1.50 per share. And this is just the declaration. So we're going to and we're going to debit our retained earnings instead of debiting dividends. You could really do either, but for the book purposes, this is what we want to do. We're going to do $1.50 a share times how many shares are outstanding. There's only 27, not 30 anymore. So we're giving a dividend of 40500 And when it's a cash dividend, even because I haven't paid it yet, we call this a common dividend payable. Now, we actually, on the 28th, we actually pay out that dividend, so this journal entry is very easy. We have our payable account, common dividend payable for $40,500. We're going to get rid of it and then credit my cash for the $40,500. So, uh, those two and three go together. Now, number four. Now we're getting back to the treasury stock and we're reselling some of it. Remember, we have 3,000 shares at $25 each for what we bought them. Now we're reissuing it for a little bit more than that. That's good. So I'm bringing in cash 
of for 1200 shares and they're paying 30 bucks a piece. So that's $36,000 in cash. And then I'm getting rid of my treasury stock. I'm not getting rid of 36,000. I'm only getting rid of $25 worth. That's what I bought them for based on my little note. And I'm getting out 1,200 shares of those $25 a piece. So that's 30,000, the treasury stock that I'm getting rid of. The rest is my gain account or like a gain. We don't call it a gain, but our paid in capital in excess of par of six grand. And that we're gonna need to remember as well going into the next one. Because we now have $6,000 on the positive. But if I ever sell, sell my treasury for way less than 25, I'm gonna to have to start digging into this 6,000. And then if I, I can't go below six, I can't take, I can't ever debit more than six, I'm gonna to have to go into my retained earnings. So again, I would be doing these in, in uh, T accounts, just like how we did in the lecture, but I'm not gonna keep those T accounts here just uh, to make sure we get through this in a reasonable amount of time. So we're gonna reissue 1,500 shares of those uh, 3,000, now at only 20 bucks a share. So I'm still bringing in cash, but I'm only bringing in 1,500 times 20 bucks a piece, bringing in 30,000. Now I'm gonna skip two lines, because I wanna go ahead and put what my credit would be, and then see what I need to get there. So remember this was 25 bucks, that's what they we bought them for times by 1,500, so that's 37.5. Now to get the debits and credits equal, the first thing I wanna go to is my, that gain account. I wanna get rid of as much gain as I can up, but not more than I have to make this balance. So I'd like to get rid of 7,500, but I don't have 7,500. Go back to journal entry number four, I only have 6,000. So all the more I can get rid of, the rest has to come out of my retained earnings, which is not good. We don't like to do that. This is taking away from the business. This would be my journal entry, just very similar to what we did in the lecture example. All right, now we're gonna do a dividend here. Record the declaration of a cash dividend of $2 per share. Well, we've to do that, we've gotta figure up how much do we have in common stock? So we had 27,000 because of the purchase. So we had 27,000, but we resold 1,200 and I resold 1,500. So now I have 29.7 common stock outstanding. And it says I am uh, doing $2 a share. So multiply this by two. 59.4, so I want to debit my retained earnings for the 59.4. You could have debited dividends as well, but in the book they have to do it like this. And I'm going to, since this is a cash one, I'm going to do a dividend payable, 59.4, because I haven't actually paid it yet. It's just declaration. Now on the October 22nd, I can actually pay it. So this one is a very easy entry. 59.4, credit your cash for 59.4. Now we're ready for the last entry and we did this uh, very similar uh, in my exercises in my lecture. This one, it's saying, pretend that you already have in your uh, income summary account, a credit balance of 52,000. So they have already closed out their revenue and expenses and they have 52,000 that they have left as a credit. So all we want to do is just put in debit our income summary for 52 to get rid of it and credit my retained earnings to show that the business had money, brought in money this year, earned income of 52 grand. Let's go ahead and check the work. Again, I haven't done part two or part three. Um, oh, I just picked the wrong one here. This one should not be paid in capital. This one should be paid in capital 
of treasury stock, not common stock. So that was the only reason that is an X there. I'm not gonna go back and fix that, that's uh, very simple. The rest of the requirements here is just do the statement of um, uh, retained earnings and then do updated. So this is where you'd be wanting to keep your T accounts in order to do part two and three. It would be very helpful to have T accounts going as well. All right, with that, you should be set to complete chapter 11.